Hello and welcome to Gardening Australia. What a fantastic time of the year it is. I've been busy in my garden, out and about at events that are going ahead again, meeting up with lots of you. I'm sure you've been super busy in your patch. And what's more, our team have been hard at it finding lots of new ideas and inspiring gardens for you. As always, there's no time to waste. Let's get into it. If you've got a small space and are searching for inspiration, just wait till you see this suburban garden oasis that turns tiny into terrific. Many Australian plants are adapted to respond to fire. And today I want to show you how you can harness those magical properties in smoke at home. I share some worm farming wisdom so you can transform kitchen scraps and weeds into garden gold. And we meet our new guest presenter, Tammy okay. Huynh, yeah. and learn what inspired so really her own garden park. Yeah, she does. She loves the heat in the cooking. We're starting this week's show by heading north, way up north. We don't get to go there as much as we'd love to, but it's always a treat to explore this tropical garden treasure. And who better to take you on a tour than Jerry? I'm at Cairns Botanic Gardens. It's the glittering horticultural emerald, the jewel in the crown of far north Queensland. And it's literally overflowing with tropical rarities, all thriving in a way that makes us, from cooler climates, green with envy, including me. Every year, tourists and locals alike flock to these grounds in droves to soak up some of the lush Tropicana. What is the layout of the gardens? There's basically four parts of the garden. Today, we're getting a special tour of the absolute highlights. My guide is curator Dr Charles Clark. And what is the number one destination for visitors? Oh, the cherry on top of the gardens is definitely the conservatory. And this is the cherry, the Watkins Munro Martin Conservatory. It was unveiled in September 2015. Its design used the Likawala Ramsayi palm leaf as its inspiration. The conservatory houses an amazing array of rare plants featuring understory tropical palms, aeroids, bromeliads, cycads, ferns, nepenthes, orchids, and a gorgeous butterfly collection. You have some fabulous foliage here. This plant is absolutely magnificent. What is it? It's beautiful, isn't it, Jerry? Yeah, this is Pentagonia wendlandii. It's a rainforest understory tree from Colombia and Ecuador in South America. It's distantly related to coffee but obviously a lot more big and spectacular and colourful than that. I have never seen the like of it anywhere. No, nor have I. Every time I visit these gardens, I pay my respects to these cycads. We've grown old together. What are they and why are they growing in baskets? Yeah, interesting question, Jerry. They're growing in baskets because they're one of the very few epiphytic cycads. Their name is Zamia pseudoparasitica, which is a bit of a mouthful. We think these plants are over 40 years old. Wow. How far would you have to travel to see the like of these? A long way, I think. These are the only ones I'm aware of that are on public display in Australia. That's pretty amazing. It is. Pretty much everywhere I look, I see aeroids. And many of them, I have no idea what they are, but they're all looking fabulously healthy. They are. It's a great environment for them. The light's right, the humidity's right, and, yeah, they just explode all year round. <laughs> I don't know all of them myself. It's not a group that I specialise in. Well, here's one everybody knows. That's a peace plant. That's not a peace plant, Jerry. This is a peace plant. Wow. How old is that? Not as old as you'd think. It's probably only about three or four years old. <laughs> but they grow really fast. I think every office should have one. As long as you've got a big office. <laughs> If that peace plant is anything to go by, Charles and his team are doing a sterling job keeping these jungle jewels sated. This fog 
adds magic to this place. Why have you used it? We chose it because we wanted to imitate the environment in cloud forests and rainforests from Central America, South America and Southeast Asia. And it's the tiny drop size that we wanted to get because a lot of these places are shrouded in mist in the mornings and the afternoons. And have you noticed the difference in the plants? Do they enjoy it as much as I do? Yeah, absolutely. They love it. And we're finding that they're growing a lot faster, they're getting fewer diseases, and we're using a lot less water in the process. Of all the aeroids, the genus Amorphophallus is one of the most talked about. And this collection is home to around 50-odd species. They're bizarre, they look like triffids, they smell incredible. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to like about them. Now, one of the other names for these is corpse flower. The most famous Amorphophallus of all, the Titanarum, Amorphophallus titanum, has this reputation for smelling like a dead animal. Now, I can smell various odours here. This one down here smells a bit like natural gas. And then there's a smell of slightly off fish wafting to me. Why do they do that? We think it's to assist with pollination because the main pollinators are carrion flies and they are very sensitive to the smells of rotting flesh. And a lot of these plants, when they're in their natural habitats, are situated quite a long way from each other. So by producing a chemical that will attract a pollinator that flies a long way, they're able to affect pollination over large distances. Now, the flowers also warm up. They do. They're what's called thermogenic flowers or thermogenic inflorescences because the flowers are actually very small on these. And at the right time during the flowering cycle, if you put your finger inside, you can actually feel the heat coming off the inflorescence. Fascinating. Charles readily admits to not knowing the origins of every species here. Some, quite simply, remain mysteries. I love my bat plant, but I've never seen anything like this. Nor have we, to be honest. It <laughs> sort of exists in the nursery, and every now and then it throws up an incredible-looking flower like this. But this is absolutely bizarre. It really is, yeah. Only in a botanic way. garden, eh? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> this eclectic collection is fascinating, ranging from the very tall to the very small, including this hidden gem. This is a ginger from Peninsula Malaysia called Zingiba malayanum, variety midnight. And it's notable for its bright yellow flowers when it's young. And as those flowers age, they turn to a hot pink color. It's a rainforest species. It likes the tropics, but it's also reasonably hardy. So you can grow it with a little bit of care further south in Australia. You are literally surrounded by botanical riches. Do you have any favorites? I do, Jerry. I've probably got about 100 favorites in this garden, but this one would be my favorite of the favorites. This is called Impatiens mirabilis, and it's basically a giant busy lizzie. And many gardeners will be familiar with busy lizzies, but this really looks like it comes from a different planet. It does. It looks like a baobab. It's almost like a tree with its fat trunk and its big, chunky, fat branches. It's actually a species that grows on limestone cliffs in southern Thailand and peninsular Malaysia, where it grows almost straight out from the surface of the cliffs, and then its branches tend to bend up. But this one's growing in the ground, so instead of bending around, it's just gone straight up. Wow. That's a stunning plant. Yeah, it's really cool, isn't it? Charles, I've been coming to these gardens for almost 40 years and every visit they get better and there's more to see. Yeah, we're always trying to make things a bit different, trying to improve beds and try and improve the flavour and appearance of the garden. So it's an ongoing job, but it's a very exciting and interesting one too. Well, it's a cracking place and it's a must-see destination. Thanks, and it's all due to the efforts of our staff who are very dedicated, very professional and give a great deal to make the gardens look the way they do. the perfect soil. Well, loam is something that a lot of people try and achieve. It's that perfect combination of sand, silt and clay particles that will drain freely, it'll hold moisture and nutrients. It makes a really good general growing media. But the truth is, 
most of us don't have it. We garden with very different soil types. But the good news is that there are plants that are adapted to grow in all of them. So whilst loam might be held up as the poster soil, I promise you that every soil type has its attributes. And if you can get to know them, you can find the perfect plants to suit. Which plants are best for stopping roadside pollution? Roads generate pollution, not only from car exhaust, but microscopic particles from tyres and brake pads. Now, if you live on a busy road, your garden can help. Plants can help intercept, trap and concentrate pollutants and stop us from breathing it in. Studies have shown that the larger the canopy, the more pollutants can be trapped and held by the plants. Our rugged leaves, rough leaves, hairy leaves, these are able to filter out pollutants from the atmosphere, stopping us breathing it in. Things like calistamins, saltbush, ficus, leucodendrons, corias, currajongs, pretty much any evergreen that's there all year long that can filter out pollutants all year round. So get planting and help you and your neighbours breathe a little easier. Can you have a hedge that is edible? Most people think of hedges as being ornamental, things like box hedge, tea trees, lily pillies. But this one is ornamental as well as being edible. It's a blueberry and it's a beauty because it has these lovely coppery coloured new growth, little white flowers, followed by the edible blueberries. It's planted about three quarters of a metre apart, grows a little bit less than two metres high, you can chop it back if you want, and it makes a really good edible hedge. Becoming a gardener is a bit like being given a key to the natural world. There's so many extraordinary relationships and adaptations that plants have evolved to thrive in even the most extreme of conditions. And you can observe and harness many of these in your own backyard. Millie's keen to learn more about this hot topic. It's no secret to gardeners that many Australian plants are adapted to respond to fire. Some need the fire to help open up and release their seed. And one of the most amazing things that can happen in the landscape after fire are those mass flowering events or ephemeral wildflowers that absolutely blaze beautifully. But something you might not know is that the answer to this spectacle lies not in the heat of the fire, but in the smoke. In the 90s, a group of scientists at Western Australia's Kings Park sifted through the nearly 4,000 chemicals contained in smoke to identify the individual compounds responsible. And today, I want to show you how you can harness those magical properties in smoke at home. You're going to need a vessel for the fire, a bucket with a lid, some hose, water, fuel for the fire, vermiculite and seed, and a vacuum. The first thing you need to do is make a small fire. And you can do it in any vessel, really. This is just a terracotta pot, but a kettle barbecue works really well, too. Because it's not a big, hot fire you're trying to make. It's a cool, smouldering, smoky burn. Now, while that's burning down, I need to get ready to capture those chemicals in the smoke. And I'm going to do it in a couple of ways. The first one is by passing the smoke through some water. I'm using this dust extraction bucket, which I've half filled with water. And then I'm going to use a piece of hose, which will run right through this hole down to the bottom, so it's actually submerged in the water. Now that the smoke is really cooking away there, I'm going to add this, which is vermiculite. It's very porous, and I want to use it to capture the smoke. So I'm just going to carefully sit that in the top there, and then on goes the lid. Once the smoke is flowing, you simply connect the hose from the fire to the bucket. Connect the vacuum, which creates suction to draw the smoke through the water and let it run for between 30 minutes and an hour. All this while the vermiculite is also absorbing the smoke in the fire pot. You can see the colour of that water has changed quite drastically because all the compounds in the smoke have been absorbed by it as the smoke passed through the water. 
And this is quite cool to touch. Now I'm just going to take these over the propagation area and show you how to use them. Having some smoke infused materials on hand really is unlocking a key to propagation. But the first thing I'm going to use is the vermiculite. I'm going to mix a small amount in a potting media. So that's going in there and then I'll mix that through. And then that goes straight into the cells. And then I'm just going to sow some seed on top. A little bit more vermiculite. That just sort of allows light in, holds that seed in place. Keep it moist. I've mixed a little bit of the smoke water, just a small amount, about a cup, into a couple of litres of water to water in my seedlings. For all those destructive outcomes of fire, there are, of course, some amazing regenerative properties, and particularly for those plants that have evolved to thrive in it. I've even read research that suggests smoke can help grow bigger, better tomato seedlings. So I reckon it's a really, really great process to have a go at. As gardeners, many of us find that our ideas are limited by the size of space that we have. But Jane's found an inspiring small garden packed with everything you could ever dream of. Just because you're gardening in a small space doesn't mean that you can't think big. And that's exactly what's happening in a tiny courtyard garden in suburban Melbourne that's being transformed by a gardener with big ideas, Jenny Downs. So when you came here, you found disadvantages, but certain advantages of living in a smaller space. Yes, I, the proximity of the plants means that you actually are closer to nature and you can see things that you wouldn't perhaps notice in a bigger garden and it's really quite interesting. Mm. It is frustrating though that you have to limit your, your garden palette in terms of the size of the plants but I find it creative to use them in another way to try and create a rainforest sort of effect. If you can use plants to do a job like yes, that it's yes. wonderful. <laughs> This area I wanted to have a separate decking area but I also wanted to have a destination to go to um, so what you see isn't necessarily all there is. I wanted to be able to walk into the garden and have a bit of an adventure as well. I wanted it to be thick and dense. Also, I wanted to block a few ugly views as yes. well. So, so that's what the crepe yes, myrtle is the crepe myrtle. It, it loses its leaves but the camellias that have been freed up and are growing up, they'll cover that space for me. Well, and, and at the back there, the whole way round, have you got camellia uh, Yes. I wanted a little forest. And, of course, this beautiful maple tree. Yes, that's really one of the features. Mm. I just love that dissection. It's, it's so it's beautiful. beautiful. It? It's mm. really... I think it's one of the most attractive um, Japanese maples mm. because it's got such a lacy, beautiful foliage. Mm. It's just gorgeous. This is such a nice little nook and I, I really think seating is so important in the garden. If you don't have a seat, you're just going to keep working all the time. It's absolutely right. I, we often come out here, have a coffee, read a book, just watch the birds. But you've um, cunningly, cunningly created this little area because it's not just a seating area, it's your clothesline. It is. It's a fixed object. I couldn't hang it anywhere else. I, there wasn't enough room. So I thought, well, how do I disguise it? So there's a cover over it. I can still dry my clothes. But also your plants. I like what you've got. You've got the Hoyas hanging up. Yes, I've had to use plants which are light in their pots because otherwise I wouldn't want the weight of it pulling down the side of the washing line. So Hoya is a, a good plant for that. And also by uh, using something like that, you can disguise uh, the, the washing line yeah. itself. When you have
have an almost empty space, it can be hard to know where to start. But Jenny went from bland to beautiful by taking her design cues from nature. This is my creek bed. When I first arrived, it was a new build. So this little area, tiny though it is, it's got sort of a self-contained yes. feeling to it. And yeah. why have you done it like this, though? I want it to be able to be visible from here so that you can look down and see the plants. And hopefully when these grow up and these grow up, you'll actually be doing a forest walk. In addition to the main garden area, there are several other small and narrow spaces. One features a wall of epiphytes in pots hanging on a frame on the side fence. This is such a narrow space, isn't it, between house and the fence? It is, but it shows you can um, do a lot with, with plants to cover the wall and to keep your house cool and uh, get variety of planting in well, it's as well. A, it's a whole green wall filled with plants that are literally just hanging in pots and you've got such a lot of variety, like this one. Yes, the Ripsalis, it's, it's, uh, it's a great one to have because in a green wall it helps you to blend plants in. Yeah. I love the zygo cactus, the, the flowers are just beautiful and, and lovely to watch. it's going to have watch. flowers for ages, look yes. at the buds coming on it. It's a real treat. And this is a treat. Isn't oh, it gorgeous? Another rat's tail, yeah, it's, Ripsalis. It's amazing that they flower. Look, these tiny little things, they're just gorgeous. Yeah, that's yeah. going to be a mass of flowers. Yes. And all of these are epiphytes. They are. just hanging down. It brings the outside in, and it's just really relaxing to be able to see this. And uh, it brings the nature into the house. <laughs> Another, Jenny calls the bayou because of the old man's beard dangling over a seating area. On the far side of the unit, Jenny has squeezed even more plants into a very narrow walkway. This baby tears is good in a small area, isn't it? It's great. It just manages itself, really. And if you run over the pavers, just pull it off and that's it. Oh. Done. And this one, this is terrific. I've, you don't often see a teach tree doing that. No, it's been sort of espaliered mm. along the fence, but mm. I also like to let it run a little bit loose because it's got a nice weeping habit. Which one is it? That's Leptospermum starry night. And the beauty is you using the fence again. Yes, yes, yeah. you have to because it's such a narrow space mm. and you've got to manage the plants in a way that they're probably not growing the way they would, but you can make them do different mm. things. Jenny shows that you don't need to be limited by a small space, but instead use it as an inspiration to bigger and better things. It doesn't matter how small your space mm. is, your garden is whatever your imagination desires. It's just, if you want it, you can do it. <laughs> Here at The Patch, we grow a wide range of seasonal annual and perennial veggies that most of you will be familiar with. But there are a few exceptions. We put in some less common plants just for a bit of variety. One such plant is the yakon. I reckon it's a great crop for your home veggie garden. Slamanthus sonchifolius, otherwise known by its common name as the Peruvian ground apple or earth apple. And it's a grouse little tuberous perennial from South America. Now, while they do look similar to Jerusalem artichokes, Yakon have shown to be far less invasive than their stable mates. They're both members of the Asteraceae, or daisy family. Yakon is a herbaceous perennial and will grow to a respectable 1.5 to 2 metres tall annually, bearing masses of yellow daisy flowers in summer and autumn. And like Jerusalem artichokes, when the cool weather sets in, they start to die back. And it's the cooler months when you want to strike. It's the perfect time to be lifting, dividing and harvesting these delicious crunchy tubers that I think taste like a mix between cucumber and apple. They have more the texture of cucumber with more the flavour of an apple. Yakon have crowns just below the soil surface with the tubers in underneath. When lifting and dividing it, I cut the stalks down to 10 centimetres from the ground and then put my fork in 
well back from the plant and gently lift it, grabbing onto the 10 centimetre stalk as I go. And if you lift and pull, they should come out nice and easily. Now, it's important to take care when lifting and dividing your yakon, especially if it's for harvest, because any damage will mean that the tubers won't store for as long. But don't worry, they can be eaten straight away. Now that we've got the clumps out of the ground, you can start to see the way the plant works. You've got these big tubers at the bottom. These are the bit that we eat. And then you've got these shoots or crowns at the top. These are what we're going to replant. Separate the crowns from the tubers. Brush the soil off the tubers and place them on a windowsill in the sun to dry and sweeten up for a couple of weeks. Make sure that they're very dry because they can go mouldy easily and then store them in a cool, dark place. If you live in an exceptionally cold and wet area, it can be a good idea to store your crowns of yakon in a pot filled with sand for the winter, ready to plant out in the spring. But if your soil drains really well, like it does here, and if your climate's nice and mild, like we've got next to this red brick wall, then you can plonk them straight back into the soil that you pulled them out of. But to prepare the soil, it's a good idea to give it a good digging over and add a good amount of compost. Make sure that the eyes are covered with about three centimetres of dirt. And when you're replanting your crowns, make sure you space them at least half a metre to a metre apart, because they can be a big, vigorous plant. And the tubers, well, they can be peeled and eaten raw or chucked in a salad. You can bake them, you can boil them, you can even juice them. And they're just as at home in a savoury dish as they are in your pudding. So what's stopping you? Crack on with a bit of yak on. Still to come on Gardening Australia, Sophie shows you a simple way to protect your precious seedlings. Josh shines a light on the different types of shade and how to make the most of them. And we meet our new guest presenter, Tammy Huynh, and learn about where her own passion for plants and gardening began. If you've ever dreamed of the farm life but are a city dweller like me, don't worry. I've got some productive friends who will help fulfil your desires. Red wrigglers, red worms, compost worms, vermiculture, whatever terms you use, these lovely little worms are a vital part of any healthy garden. They turn our scraps and waste into high quality food for plants so that we can grow more plants and flowers for ourselves, giving us garden gold. There's different ways to harness their good work and it all starts by creating a decent setup. There's lots of different varieties of manufactured worm farms out there. This is a rectangular variety with three levels. You can get circular versions of it. You can get wheelie bin like ones. Alternatively, you can upcycle a couple of polystyrene boxes. You could even get a old bathtub and build a frame for it. The main thing from a location point of view is keep them out of direct sunlight or strong prevailing winds. The worms we use in farms are species that live typically in the top layers of the soil or the leaf litter and they help to break down organic matter. Your farm needs to mimic this natural environment. Your worms need ample moisture and oxygen because they breathe through their skin. So this feeding layer, or call it the dining room, doesn't want to be saturated. It just needs to have a consistency of, say, a moist sponge. I'm lucky because I've got a plentiful supply of food scraps. Yeah, good. There's my own that I put in my bench top tidy, but I also have my own little share waste system where about 15 houses bring me their food scraps and they drop it into this bucket. And there's all sorts of different things that people include in these scraps. 
And the big question still remains, what can and what can't I feed my worms? Well, the key thing is diversity. You don't want all of the one same thing because this is a living, breathing thing. You don't want it to compact and block out all the air. I'm always asked, can you put citrus in a worm farm? The answer is yes, you can, but not too much. And the other thing you can do is actually put your citrus into the freezer and when it thaws out and goes into the worm farm, all the cells have been broken by freezing and that way it's easier for the worms to digest it. Bear in mind that you don't want to overload your worm farm with too many scraps. Put enough out and then monitor it and as you get a feeling for how much and how long it takes for them to eat what you put out, you can then add more as your worm numbers increase. It's important to remember that worms only have small mouths, so they can't get themselves around really big chunks of food. When you're actually chopping up scraps, chop them a little bit more, and then that way it'll be easier, but most of all quicker for the worms to digest it. The other thing to remember is worms don't actually have teeth. What they do to break food down is grind it through their stomach. And to help in that grinding process, a little scoop of garden soil from time to time will add some grit. And that grit helps crush the food and turn it into castings a lot quicker. Now, when your worm farm here is full and the worms have eaten all the scraps, what you end up with is this, which is this beautiful, rich worm castings, otherwise known as worm poo, because they've digested it and turned it into this fertiliser for your garden. Now, the simplest method that I find for harvesting the worm castings is to start to scrape layers off and give the worms a chance to dive down out of the light, just like teenagers, if you open the curtains early in the morning. They don't want it. They hide under the doona and go deeper and deeper. So what I like to do is take off the first couple of centimetres because in that layer, there's usually eggs and babies. So I want to save those. So I just scrape that off like so and I put it aside into a, a separate container and I'll put that back in at the end. Next, I start to scrape down around about 20 millimetres. And as I scrape, I just keep an eye out and see whether I'm um, coming across any worms. But at this point, I can't see any, which is good. So I've got another container here and I'll just pick that out. And look, there's one worm. If you see one, just save it, put it in there. That's fine. And now, normally I'd wait about 10 minutes and that way the light beaming down on here is forcing the worms further south. Then we go again. Once I reach pretty close to the bottom or where there's a lot of worms, I say, enough, take that, get this, pour that back in, and then you can start feeding this tray again, and away you go to repeat the cycle. Whether you use these worm castings around your pot plants, around your garden plants, or if you turn it into a slurry and a liquid fertiliser, either way, the benefits of all that hard work by the worms is going to be appreciated by every single one of your plants. These gorgeous wriggling red workers are creating garden magic. Follow a few simple tips and become a wise worm farmer and keep harvesting that goodness.
gardeners planted out young seedlings and come back a few days later to find they've been wiped out by hungry insects. Ground-dwelling insects with biting and chewing mouthparts like slaters, earwigs and millipedes can wipe out susceptible seedlings almost overnight and that can be the end to your veggie patch before you've even started. Today we're going to look at a simple way to protect your new seedlings and repurpose something that we've all got in our garden sheds, old plastic pots. I've just planted these lettuce seedlings, so I'm going to build some protective collars which will act like fortresses. But to do so, you'll need some scissors and some copper tape. This copper tape is known as snail and slug barrier because they don't like to cross it. So I'm going to add a strip to the top of these pots to give my seedlings extra protection. There you go. So all you have to do is nestle it around your seedlings. Now, I like to push it in a couple of centimetres so that it doesn't get blown away in the wind or get knocked off by a bird. I like to make sure that I've got at least seven centimetres sticking out of the soil to give the new plants protection. And obviously, this is only for the first few weeks when tender young seedlings are very vulnerable to insect attack. Then you can take these covers off and reuse them for your next planting. There you go, we've made a seedling fortress to protect them from being eaten, while at the same time putting your old pots to good use. Even the smallest garden can be filled with nuance. Areas that are better suited to growing a range of different species. Josh wants to shine a light on the value of shade. During the warmer months, for many Australians, it's all about sun, sand and surf. But for us gardeners, there's one more very important thing on that list. Shade. When the temperature really gets up there, we tend to think of shade in terms of protection. At the height of summer, our precious plants can soon become stressed if they're in full sun and aren't equipped to handle the heat. But shade needs to be considered all year round because all plants, to varying degrees, need light to grow. So it's a question of how much light or shade a plant needs to thrive. And to answer that, you need to understand the type of shade in your garden. This area of our backyard was designed to create seasonal shade by choosing a deciduous canopy. In winter, this Gladitzia drops all of its leaves and lets in the sun. But its leaves provide filtered shade during the hottest part of the day in the warmer months. The understory also gets hit with low angle morning and afternoon sun in summer, which can be intense. So I've chosen plants that can tolerate this type of inconsistent shade. For example, succulents need a certain amount of direct sunlight each day. And this position offers these aloes and this cotyledon the right kind of ratio. They're doing really well. Lamandras have a reputation for being tough and adaptable to all kinds of growing conditions and this one is thriving. Another plant that is performing well in this area under seasonal shade is this Neoregelia bromeliad. There are a number of different cultivars available with various degrees of sun tolerance. Bleach leaves are a sure sign that bromeliads are getting too much sun. These ones down here are looking lush and beautiful. So I'm gonna plant another variety to add some more color. Neoregelias are epiphytic and generally very hardy. I'm placing it in a shallow hole and backfilling around the base with shredded pine bark, which is a bit like leaf litter in the crevice of a tree or on a forest floor. After an initial watering in, it will only need a weekly top up around the base and over the foliage to keep it happy. 
I reckon this is the kind of scenario that springs to mind when most of us think of shade. I love these dwarf sugar gums, which I planted to provide morning summer sun protection to the eastern side of the house. The thing is, being evergreens, they provide dry shade to the area underneath year round. There's a bunch of native grasses here that have established well as part of this habitat garden, including things like Lamandra, Coastal Sword Sedge and Dianella. But there is a bare patch towards the back that I need to deal with. I'm going to fill out this area with a selection of plants that are proven performers in dry shade, including Coria, Bichonneau Bells, Acacia Cognata Limelight and Dianella Casa Blue and I'm planting quite densely to quickly fill the space. I've chosen small plants in 140 millimetre pots, so I only have to dig small holes to minimise disturbance to the base of the tree. Any small tree roots should be cut cleanly, and roots thicker than your finger, avoided. This sandy soil is really impoverished, so I'm going to add some soil conditioner to help the plants along until they're established. So a couple of handfuls in the bottom of the hole and then I'll just work that in and really mix it with the site soil so the bottom of the hole remains free draining. Just like that. Then just pop the plant in. Tease it out of the pot. That's looking good. A little bit of a tickle. And then into the hole. Soil in dry shade often becomes hydrophobic, so I'm applying an organic liquid wetting agent. It's a competitive environment, so the plants will need watering a couple of times per week until established, and then once a week when it's hot. Finally, some mulch to finish it off. Another type of cover that you can use to your advantage is controllable shade. This is the main living area of our home. It faces north and has been designed to capture low angle winter sun. In the warmer months, we want protection from the hot sun. So we put up these removable shade sails and I've also planted a grapevine, which of course is deciduous. This variety is called perlet. And while it gives us a lot of fruit mid season, we're also growing it for the leafy canopy it provides. By trimming back the canes, I can create just the right conditions underneath for growing a range of productive plants, including Mediterranean herbs, macrot lime, lemongrass and blueberry. And whilst these plants will take full sun, they really thrive and use less water with a touch of shade. Growing in shade is often seen as challenging, but if you understand the type of shade and then choose the right plants to suit, you'll open up all sorts of opportunities. I'm so excited to introduce our next story. A while back, you might remember, I met up with horticulturist Tammy Quinn, who showed us how to brighten up a space with kokodamas. And that's it. There's your kokodama. Well, it's a pleasure to let you know that Tammy's joining the team as our new guest presenter with lots of fresh ideas to bring more plants into our lives, indoors and out. But first, let's find out where Tammy got those green thumbs. I love the way that plants can make you feel. You can have such a range of emotions from calm to just excited because there's a new leaf growing or a flower coming up. But also just, you know, seeing the process of the plant from being a seed to a seedling to then something harvestable and then having it all die down and then composting and returning it to the earth. I think that's such a beautiful process. My name is Tammy Huynh. I'm a horticulturist. I'm a garden writer. I'm an educator, a plant lover, a garden lover, all things to do with plants. I live in Cabramatta and that's in southwest Sydney. I've pretty much been here for most of my life. So I come from a, quite a big family, so there's mum and dad and then there's five of us. So I'm not quite the middle child, but um, yeah, so second eldest. My parents came from or escaped the Vietnam War and they wanted the best for us. 
This garden was started by my grandma. She always grew her own things. That's what they did back in Vietnam, grew to sell to obviously sustain the family. I, you know, very close to her um, as I was growing up because she sort of looked after us while my parents went to work. She grew everything from, you know, just lettuce to, to beans to everything that you could possibly eat, really. And when she passed about five or six years ago now, then that's when my parents sort of really took over. And it kind of worked out that they were sort of heading into semi-retirement. He's OK? Yeah. yeah. So I think they've really you know, taken it to you know, where Grandma had it. I think there's some capsicum and some chilli. And I'll put some chilli in too. Mum's very... Uh, Let's just dig a hole and put it in there and see what happens, kind of gardener. And I think it's worked. I mean, everything's growing really well. Nejongi, go gardener, Nejongi, me. Um, I mean, hay Asian ma, so but the food hay Asian, but they do jongi lo, mui yeng do jongi lo. Yeah, she loves all the different things. I guess <laughs> seasonality and being able to grow things that she did grow back home. Nejongi, I'll tell you more. Yeah, she does. She loves the heat in the cooking. Um, so yeah, definitely love planting chilies. It's a north-facing garden, which is great. Everything grows really well, but there's nothing on either side of the east and west boundaries, so we get the full brunt of the sun. We've got a lot of productive areas, lots of fruits and veggies growing, um, lime, lots of different herbs. Garlic chives are one of my favourites, so we've always got them perennial growing. But yeah, it's a real sort of eclectic mix of things. Even in the productive patch, we've got some ornamental things sort of just hanging about just because we didn't know where else to put them. And then through here, come and have a look at this dragon fruit. So it's growing on a structure here because it's a climbing cactus, so it does need to climb and it does need a structure to then grow and spread. It doesn't look particularly attractive, and if you get too close, the thorns will scratch you. I've done that many times. But we do have some flowers that have died there, but the fruit is forming, so we've got a couple of little ones growing there. And then we've also got little chicks, or chooks, I should say, one sort of scratching around over there, and the couple are sort of roaming around. There is lots of taro growing in the garden, and Mum loves to use it in her cooking, so in soups, and also she loves to pickle it as well. So what she's saying is that you have to wait for the, the stems to fall away from the main clump, then they're a bit more flexible, so then you know they're ready to harvest, and you just cut it off at ground level then she'll pickle it. So she um, strips all the, the leaf sheaths back and then she'll, you puts it in salt and then in a bucket to just let it pickle away for how long? Uh, for four weeks. For about four weeks. Typically mum then uses it in stir fries. This one? It's a bit sour, the taste, um, but she cooks it with oyster sauce, so there's a little bit of sweetness too, so sweet and sour. So part of the decision to study horticulture was because my parents kind of randomly decided that they were going to buy a piece of land and plant bamboo. They wanted to harvest edible bamboo shoots and then supply them to the city markets. So that's what really got me into it. I mean, I love gardening, but I didn't know I could, you know, actually study it and, and do something with it. The bamboo farm is in Peach Ridge. It's north of Sydney. There's lots of hectares of bamboo. I don't know how many, but there's lots. So I helped my parents plant out the bamboo, or all my family did, that we spent here many long weekends there. And then eventually I decided to write about it for my honours thesis. What I personally love about bamboo is just the sheer size they get to because it grows so tall but everyone sort of assumes it's probably a tree but it's actually a grass it's one of the fastest growing grasses in the world so we grow a couple of edible bamboo shoots here this is dendrocalamus latifloris it's also known as sweet bamboo and i think it's because the the shoots are quite sweet when they're eaten it grows quite tall it's up to about 25 meters this clump here is probably well over 10 years old. Definitely not for the small garden. So if you have a large one, yes, definitely go for it. The Dendrocalamus asper um, is a bit darker in colour, a bit more brown with a green tinge. It's also known as a giant bamboo just because of the size it gets to. So the most identifying feature are these velvet-like hairs on the culms or the stems of the bamboo. And if you go all the way down to the bottom, we've then got the bamboo shoot and that's what's edible. So to prepare this, 
you need to remove all the leaf sheets. Let's see if I can do that for you now. And then that gives you the bamboo shoot. You would need to boil it first before you eat it. It has a bit of bitterness to it. And once you do boil it, then you can add it to your soups and stir fries. Bamboo is what sort of got me into horticulture, but it hasn't made me stay there. So I've seen the beauty and, and so much more that I can do with plants. So that's why I haven't necessarily gone back to the bamboo yet, but I may. There's just so much, so much variety in horticulture. So at home, I do have a little dedicated space where I can just experiment with plants. So this is my little ornamental alley. It's where I spend a lot of my time tinkering, experimenting, and just being, because it's such a lovely place to be. It's out of the sun. It's, you know, just a small area that's sort of been fashioned out of old steel posts. We've got chicken wire, we've got real estate signs, we've got, you know, random just sheeting. But it works for the purpose and it just allows me to sort of do my thing away from everyone else. And yeah, it's my, my happy space. So I wanted to share with you this plant here. It's a Schefflera. I really like it just because of how the leaves are arranged, just like your typical Schefflera. It sort of comes out like a um, little umbrella, I guess. The leaves are a lot more jagged or toothed, so it just looks really cool. So this is one of another one of my favourite plants. It's the Anthurium vichii. It is a tropical plant, so it hasn't grown as well as it really should have. The leaves can grow up to almost a metre long, but you can still see that it's still growing well, just the leaves. Like, they're just so beautiful to look at. They kind of remind me a bit of abs, <laughs> just because of the rib texture. I think it adds a lovely textural contrast. Uh, so I've got quite a few variegated plants. So what can happen with variegated plants is that they can revert back to green, the solid green leaf. What you can do to help encourage more variegation is to actually cut it back to where the variegation is more prominent. And provided you do have a node, you can actually continue to propagate that. But I just put in a glass of water and roots will form and it will grow again. So I do a lot of teaching online and also in local garden centres. I meet many people at workshops who haven't grown anything at all, but they want to, but they just don't know where to start. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's uh, the nature of gardening. If oh, your hands right. or the table wasn't dirty, yeah. I'd be concerned. Is there a market <laughs> for the garden? <laughs> this is sweet. You've got a broom. broom. Yeah. <laughs> I love seeing people have that light bulb moment when they learn that they can look after a plant. So that's an interesting one. It is a jungle cactus. Because most of the time people come and they're not sure what to do or they've killed many plants. So being able to share how to grow plants and then see that they can um, is what I really hope people can walk away with. That knowledge to grow and make sure it's got a brightly lit spot. And okay. it will grow really well for you. Oh, nice, thank you. <laughs> I'm so looking forward to joining Tammy as she scours the city and suburbs, uncovering the very best ideas for growing. From balcony garden basics to hydroponic heroes and DIY indoor ideas. What's more, Tammy, can I say big congrats to you for receiving the 2021 Australian Institute of Horticulture's Horticulturist of the Year. You are rocking it, sister. Now, it's that time again for me to G you up with your list of jobs for the weekend. Here goes. Cool temperate gardeners give your compost some care for Compost Awareness Week. Add some comfrey and blood and bone to your bin to heat up your heap as the weather cools. Plant pea and broadbean seeds now, giving them the winter to establish deep roots. You'll be ahead of the game when the weather warms up and the frosts disappear. If you live in an area of low temperatures and frost, installing and securing plastic, shade cloth or cardboard over plants during evenings of predicted frost will help keep your plants protected. In warm temperate areas, keep an eye out for the glorious autumn colours of kangaroo grass, Themida triandra. Bronze, rusty and red, this native grass is an awesome ornamental. Sling some sage into your brassica patch. This incredible edible is not just delicious, it's a cracking companion plant, great at keeping the cabbage white butterfly at bay. 
get warm and work on your lawn, which will set up for summer success. Remove thatch with a rake, top dress and patch depressions and over sow thin areas of turf. Subtropical gardeners give your tomatoes some TLC. Remove yellowing lower leaves, pinch out excess growth and laterals to increase fruit production and prevent pest problems. Plant your own flowering meadow in pots or your patch. Think alyssum, borage, calendula, dill, viola and parsley. Bring in the good bugs with a great looking floral display. Keep your leafy lettuces, spinach, silver beet and Asian greens growing great guns. Be sure to give them a fortnightly feed with a fish or seaweed emulsion. They'll love you for it. What about adding a worm farm to your tropical garden? A breeze to set up and look after. Worm farms are a wonderful way to turn organic waste into garden goodness. If palm fronds are a problem at your place, why not put them to good use? Lay them over garden beds to protect soil from erosion or bury them where they'll rot down and improve the soil. The traditional owners of the Darwin region, the Larrakia people, know this season as Damabilla, a time of bush fruit where kakadu plums ripen and seeds of the dundle bush peanut are eaten. Arid zone gardeners start collecting your capers. Harvest buds early in the morning when they're nice and tight and repeat every few days for plenty of pickles. Black aphids are up and about at the moment, so keep an eye out for these sap suckers, particularly on onions and chives. When you see them, squash them or squirt with white oil. Celebrate Compost Awareness Week and brew up a bucket of compost tea. Whack weeds into water, wait a week, dilute until see-through and treat your plants to a cup or two. Have a wonderful weekend, gardeners, and don't forget to join the fun on our Facebook and Instagram pages. Well, I hate to say it, but that's all we have time for. But... Don't worry, because I'll meet you here in the garden again next week. It's going to be a fun one. I'll see you then. If you're looking for bright, bold colour for your garden and a plant that's almost indestructible, look no further than the Bougainvillea. I'll be sharing some tips on the best varieties to grow and how to grow them. I'll show you what happens when a plant collector has the space for their obsession to run wild. And we meet a vegan chef with a love of the bountiful harvest from her garden. No dairy, no eggs, purely what you can grow in the ground. <laughs>